Our speaker, Susan, holds a Ph.D. degree in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University. She was a psychotherapist for more than 46 years, working with individuals and couples. For more than two decades, the topic of desire on the life path has been f a focus of her exploration and practice. She has drawn from her own experiences and those of clients and friends, as well as those from psychological concepts to distill understanding on the topic. Teachings from several wisdom traditions have guided the process. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. And I will just add a word about the, da the Dana. Um, I have, through these weeks, I've just been so grateful for Great Trees in Temple and for Tejo and for all of you. So I do hope that you will support this place and this community of practice and of wisdom. So our topic today, as Lorna said, is practicing desire as joy. And when I think back on where I first encountered that idea, I think it was probably uh, back in the 80s when some of the ecstatic mystical poets became very popular in our culture. Rumi and Heifetz and others who express their longing for the divine, for wholeness in ecstatic terms. And our culture was quite hungry for these ideas. Uh, the books of their poetry were extremely um, popular. There was a, a translator, a poet translator in Georgia, Coleman Barks, who he, he just had a um, quite a successful career. I remember calling him to ask him if he would come to Savannah. And what he said was, you can't afford me. <laughs> he was at that point so popular, which is pretty amazing. I, I remember I was playing a, a cassette tape of probably Coleman Barks reading Rumi's poetry when my teenage son came into the room and he like dropped what he was carrying and just stood in amazement at, at these words. So I'm just gonna read one of Rumi's short poems that is about the joy of longing. The name of it is The Cry of Separation. Listen to the reed and the tale it tells, how it sings of separation. Ever since they cut me from the reed bed, my wail has caused men and women to weep. I want a heart that is torn open with longing so that I might share the pain of this love. Whoever has been parted from his source longs to return to that state of union. And then there are others, the Christian mystics like Teresa of Avila, who wrote with such longing of her love of Jesus. She had been in the convent for, I think, a couple of decades. And it, it was good. She chose to be there, but it was a bit on the dry side until one day she was walking in the halls of the convent and someone had left a statue of Jesus askew across the hallway. And in irritation, she picked it up and she describes what it was like to see his face that was a combination of the, his own suffering and his compassion. And she fell in love and spent the rest of her life in longing for that love and in setting up Carmelite communities around France to, um, to be dedicated to that love. Um, then in my own life, I ran into the people who wrote about Ramakrishna, the Hindu sage, who was such a lover of Ma Kali, 
a warrior goddess that he experienced as his mother protecting him. Um, and then in your own tradition, I, I ask myself, do, do I see that kind of longing? It would not be, it's because yours is a non-dual tradition, you don't see yourself as separate from the wholeness, separate from the divine, if you will. But think about your bows, how as you express that devotion, that appreciation for the community, for your cushion, the um, symbol of your practice, that I think that longing is expressed in the bows and in the offering of incense to Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion. So we've all probably experienced that longing. And for me, it was a bit of a, it was a, a leap to go from, yes, I know what that longing is like, to it being a joyful longing. Um, I would have to remind myself, oh, yeah, this feeling of, of suffering, of emptiness, of incompleteness. Oh, yeah, I remember now. This is my longing for wholeness. It's not something wrong with me. It is something right with me that I naturally long for all that we are. So then the question is, all right, once we at least get that idea and can remember that there is joy in that longing and we can nurture that joy, then we have to ask, okay, can, can we experience that joy of longing for other desires? I remember talking to my friend about this when I first started down this road and she said, oh no, <laughs> no, no, I experience desire and longing as um, bitter as suffering. And I said, well, yeah, I, I think most of us do have that experience too, but can we learn that it can be joyful? After all, well, I, I remember watching a, a video of a series from long ago on PBS, um, uh, the Bill Moyers series on world religions. And he was interviewing Houston Smith about Zen teachings on desire. And he said that humans desire pleasure, success, responsibility, which I think of as the ability to genuinely respond and liberation. So, all right, we're getting it that this longing for liberation can be joyful. How about these others that perhaps we see as less lofty, less ultimate than the desire for awakening? Um, and I, I find myself wondering if all of these desires are in fact a form of longing for wholeness that we, you know, we long for a particular toy or adventure because there's a sense that that is part of wholeness. Uh, we long for particular success because we sense that that is a part of our awakening and so on. So we have a story that we're going to spend the rest of our time with today. I see I forgot to stop to start my timer. I'll start it now. Um, so our story is one of Shiva and Parvati from the Hindu mythology. I beg your pardon that I, I don't know Zen stories that I could use. We'll have to depend on Tejo and some of you for those stories. But in this one, the story begins with Shiva meditating in complete repose 
on an icy mountaintop. He is in utter stillness and peace, but trouble is already brewing for him and that Parvati, who represents the sum total of energy and the universe. And for our purposes, she really represents desire. So she is being born. And from very early in her infancy, she has these dreams of this figure on the mountaintop who is in such complete stillness. And as I was starting to work with this story, my friend Margie sent me a, um, a story about some fish who were being sent from wherever their origin was to, toward the Field Museum in Chicago. And there was a, something of a storm and the ship that they were on experienced turbulence. So everybody, all the people were in their cabins. And after the turbulence had subsided, the people who were traveling with the fish came out to check on them, hoping that they had not sloshed over the side of their tank. And in fact, they found them deep within the tank. So the fish had done what they do in their natural setting when there is turbulence in the sea, they had dived deep. And of course, that's important for us. If we want to experience desire as joy, we need to dive deep into our practices, into our stillness, into our contact with consciousness itself. Now, Parvati continues to have these dreams and all through her infancy, her childhood, her adolescence. And as she enters young adulthood, she sends for a comma, K-A-M-A, which is in our experience, that would be something like a Cupid whose job it is to be a messenger and to bring the message of desire to the desired object. So she calls for a comma and she tells him her dream. And he says, oh, I know who that is. You are meant for him. I will take you to Mount Kalos where he is. So here's our sort of We'll put these two together and say that our, our first requirement, if we're to practice um, desire as joy, is to return to the depths of awareness when we are compelled by a call of our desires. So at this moment, we're going to just take a minute to, to practice. So I would invite you to either close your eyes or gaze softly as you do in your Zen practice. And it helps, of course, to focus on the breath. And we're gonna have a story within a story here. And this, oddly enough, is the story from Monsters Incorporated. If you saw that, animated film. So in this film, monsters enter the rooms of sleeping children. Now these are good monsters. They come to get energy from the sleeping children and to take it back to the utility company, which is Monsters Incorporated. So we have to get this visual here that they're entering through the closets, but there's a back door to the closet. And that door goes into the central utility company. So every, um, every closet has a back door that opens into this common space. And I've come to think of that as the common energy, the common good, 
So I want you to imagine that you are in this space in between where you can communicate with what we might, we might call awakening children. That would be us. And you can communicate with the utility company. So let's go first to the room of these awakening children and let's ask for a desire to practice with this morning. So just notice what desire is present in this awakening child that is you, that is me. It may be one that you've been aware of, probably is. It may be one that you're working toward. Be present with it. And then let yourself take this, we can call it information, we can call it energy, into the utility company. And just check and see, is this a desire that can be seen as for the highest good? That it at least helps you move toward your awakening and that your your thoughts, your emotions, your beliefs come up and can be met in your practice. And maybe you can see how it's for the highest good in other ways too. And how much energy is in this desire? I I think that there was something that there was an instrument that we might call it an energy meter in the film. So bring this desire into contact with this energy meter and see is, is there enough desire here? Because it it takes it takes some energy to have the persistence that's needed for desire to be joy. And if you need to go back into that closet, which I think of as a closet of mindful awareness, you might go back there and just see if you need to tweak this desire. Does it need to be changed so that you can see how it's for the highest good? Do you need to nurture it? Do you need a different desire? We want to come out of these moments with the closest you can find to a true desire that is for the highest good and has a strong charge. And then let's open our eyes or come back to the Zoom screen. And we're ready for the next section of the story. And this one, the comma takes our heroine um, to Mount Kailas and his chariot. And when they arrive, she hides behind a stone and he goes to deliver his message to Shiva. And he tells her him, I have brought one who has desired you since her birth. And Shiva opens his eyes from his deep repose and says, who are you that you would disturb me with this common request? And at that moment, he emits from his third eye a lightning bolt that reduces the comma to ashes. And we might recognize that as the resistance 
that deep stillness has to being disturbed. Um, I notice in myself that sometimes it seems like each step, certainly the beginning, but each step toward a desire encounters this resistance. Like, I don't want to be bothered. I just want to be still. I want to be peaceful. In fact, in the mornings, after I meditate and, and chant, there's resistance to even getting up to doing yoga postures. And I have to meet that resistance in order to arise. So we, we recognize, at least I do, that resistance. And um, Parvati comes running out of her hiding place and says, what have you done? And Shiva says, who are you? She answers, I am Parvati, but I fear now I will be known as Parvati, the destroyer. She says, those who are meant for you should be met with courtesy, not such hostility. Shiva laughs. He's not accustomed to being spoken to in this way. He is, after all, the God of consciousness. And here she dares to confront him. He laughs, he tries to return to utter stillness, and he can't. With her by his side, he is, he's disturbed, but he's taken with her beauty and her charm. And she, who is quite persistent, says, well, I'll just sit here beside you. If I am to be with you, I must do as you do. So she imitates his posture, uh, starting out with that probably full lotus posture, and then probably goes on to imitate his other practices. And sitting there beside Shiva, imitating him, she makes great progress in her movement toward the awakening that her dreams of Shiva probably represent. And he, he is infused with her energy and her joy. She is infused with his wisdom and his stillness, his stability. So side by side, there is such progress that one day a group of celestial beings who are frightened by their progress come and interrupt them and beg them to stop. They say, we're afraid that you will melt known reality through the power of your practices. And they open their eyes, always a good thing to do, open our eyes and see what's happening. And Parvati says, okay, you know, I." She had great compassion for them and their fear. She says, I'll just sit here. And so they continued to sit and infuse each other with these qualities. And I think at this moment, we will pause to do another short practice. So if you would, just... Be still, focus on the breath. Feeling this partnership inside yourself because we all have it. <laughs> this partnership of stillness and stability 
and desire, energy, movement. Feel them infusing each other as they sit side by side. Be aware of your desire that you have chosen to be with. And feel these qualities as they are present with this desire. Aware of your own experiences of resistance, of running into obstacles like these celestials to cool your practice, your movement toward your desire. See yourself taking next steps toward your desire, meeting the resistance that comes up, meeting it with perhaps the same qualities that are present in this story that help melt Shiva's resistance, beauty, humor, gratitude. You might see yourself taking a step in the presence of beauty, either doing the step in a beautiful place or being in a beautiful place before you take the step. Perhaps experiencing the beauty of a practice like Tonglen, where as you experience your own resistance, your own suffering, you breathe in the suffering of other beings who might have similar suffering. And you breathe out the light of compassion. For humor, I think it's pretty funny to imagine that peace junkie inside ourselves that just wants stillness, emitting lightning bolts to try to destroy what would come to disturb it. And it's our avoidance tactics are pretty funny. Usually there are things about ourselves that we can enjoy ch chuckling at. And those chuckles help to melt the obstacles and the resistance. And gratitude, gratitude for your practice, gratitude for the desire itself that focuses your life energy and brings the things up to be met in practice. knowing that our wisdom teachings are not really incorporated in our lives until we have lived them. And knowing that these desires and their directing us in our outer lives give us that chance to live them.
And all of this gives us the chance to detach from the anxiety about immediate results. So let us open our eyes now just to receive the second guidance on practicing desire as joy, to receive, to receive it in the form of an, an instruction. Meet challenges in the partnership of consciousness and desire with beauty, humor, and gratitude which allow detachment from immediate outcome, opening to clear vision of where we are and moving toward the desire. One of the things I thought of while we were doing our practice, an example from your own center there, early in the life of Great Tree, I know there were times that there was concern about how the mortgage would be met. And I remember learning that in the midst of that concern, your community folded paper cranes. That that was the activity you did. They, they were beautiful. They expressed the wisdom and the teaching. They were generous. These were offered to... I don't know how else they were used, but I know they were given to people who donated to Great Tree. So in your own center, you have that practice that was an example of detaching from anxiety about the immediate outcome. And we know Great Tree is still here. <laughs> so... It must have worked. <laughs> so now we're ready for the final episode in our Shiva Parvati story. So Shiva is so grateful for Parvati's presence at his side that he says, what can I offer you? What can I give to you? And Parvati said, I want only to be your life partner. I want us to be together. And I want the blessing of my parents for this union. So she took Shiva to meet her parents. And they were, as you might imagine, not completely pleased with this union. He uh, he was seen as a ne'er-do-well. He was into non-doing. But he won uh, Parvati's mother over through his polite decorum. And of course, this wouldn't have been a surface politeness. This would have been a courtesy, a kindness born of deep wisdom, of compassion, as he knew the oneness of all life. The father was a harder nut to crack. This was not the union he had in mind for his dear daughter, but she won him over with sheer persistence, her complete certainty that this was the right union for her life, the right life partnership. So they plan a ceremony they have the ceremony. Um, they have a celebration afterward. And Shiva's friends also were not impressive to the family. They were all sorts of ghosts and goblins and demons because, as we talked about last week, Shiva could welcome all. He's, 
as we see the unsavory things in ourselves, the things we wish were not there, we get a chance to welcome them with that illumined mindfulness that actually offers them an embrace. So now it's the celebration and Shiva and Parvati are ready to take off for Mount Kailas to celebrate this union. And Shiva, before he goes, tells his, um, his friends, you know, I'm glad you're here, but behave well. So as I think about what that is, I think of the popular book, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for weeks, some time ago, of course, um, it's called The Prayer of Jabez. And this prayer shows up in the book of Chronicles in the Old Testament. It's right in the middle of a, a line of begats, so-and-so begats, so-and-so begats, so-and-so who begat Jabez. And Jabez prayed this prayer. Oh, that thou would enlarge my boundaries, a prayer of desire, enlarge my boundaries, but take my hand that I may do no harm. There you have that partnership again with, if we want to enlarge our boundaries, we have to have this partnership with wisdom, with consciousness. And there's the awareness that we can make errors. So do no harm. And so off they go and they celebrate their union with great joy until once again, wouldn't you know, the celestials show up and say, stop. We're afraid that the fruits of this union will melt it will destroy reality as we know it. But as they stopped, a drop of the essence of their union falls through a crack in the etheric universe down toward what is to be our manifest reality, a creation story here. And even then, it was considered too hot, too hot to handle. But the Ganges River offered to receive this drop so that it could be cooled by the practices of devotees who come to the river to cleanse themselves and to cremate their dead to do their ceremonies of devotion. So we have here, then in this final stage, the recognition that number one, something will slip through. You know, that's part of what makes it joyful. It may not be that we create what we originally desired. It may be that it's something on the way to the desire. It may be something completely different. It may be something new in consciousness. But but we do, we do we do create something new through this partnership of desire and consciousness. And in order to nurture it so that it grows to fulfillment, it needs our, our devotion practices. It needs our reverence, our appreciation. So let us take just a couple of minutes here to again be still, to imagine our commitment to this partnership of desire and 
consciousness. It's not just a sometimes thing. It's there even when we're not practicing. It's there in the background. Now, for most of us, it's pretty hard to um, have them present at the same time. We'll have times that they are, but more often it's moving from one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. But there's great power in that. So with your desire, know with certainty that something new will be created. Feel the joy and the desire, feel the stability in the consciousness and in your practices that bring you back to awareness again and again and again. And feel your devotion to the practices, to the desires that direct you on your life path. And we'll open our eyes so that I can read the summary of that final section, which is commit to bring desire and consciousness together again and again, accepting with gratitude and devotion the inevitable manifestation of new creation. Don't you love the word inevitable? <laughs> the inevitable manifestation of new creation. So we've gotten a chance to see over th these three weeks how desire focuses our life energy and brings up what we need to meet in consciousness. We've seen how we want to meet it in consciousness with that kind of mindfulness that is that is filled with compassion and and we've seen this partnership of desire and consciousness that can allow desire even for um what we might think of as the earlier desires even before before the ultimate desire for liberation, how, how these desires too can be joyful. All right, I thank you. And it's your turn now. Would somebody maybe write in the chat my email address? Because I would love feedback from people that don't want to talk on the Zoom call. My email address is S B Lamb at AOL.com. A good old stable email address. Oh, it's the app. <laughs> Can you see it? You oh, there, Chris put it in. There oh. it is. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tejo. All I right. That, Chris did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. <laughs> This was a this is a great story. Thank you. It is a great story, isn't it? <laughs> so are there comments, questions, um, associations, your own experience? Am I the only one that experiences the lightning bolts <laughs> as resistance? <laughs> I was thinking about what you said last week, Trey, about you know how students will procrastinate and avoid, and and just how true that is. Remembering what it's like before you write the first line of the term paper, before you start to organize the material for the 
the paper is like there's this feeling like it's not going to come together right i don't know what to do and somehow to meet that and skip my husband was saying last night he would it's like he would find he had to pick up the pen. He had to write a sentence. And that was the beginning. Yeah. Yes. Is there somebody there that's wanting to say, hey, Caitlin, you need to unmute yourself. Experiencing resistance from my iPad. Um, <clears throat> I, I find it so interesting that Resistance just is so large, but it's so mundane. It's like, um, I get the most resistance on the things that I most don't wanna do, but are the most better, the, the best things for me. Um, and that's always very telling for me. And, um, uh, and then it's really interesting to give myself a little space to say, why am I resisting? Why am I procrastinating? What does this mean? What does this fear mean to me? Like, um, and one little trick that I've used for some things is like, I, I heard somewhere it was just like, what would happen if it actually went right? Mm -hmm. And it was, and it's just kind of one of those, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's, it kind of is helpful because then it's like, um, it just sort of, gives me a little different point of view. I mean, I might, you know, the mundane things to break through resistance are exactly those, like getting all your tools out or getting um, getting your iPad ready or getting, um, getting your, you know, getting walking shoes next to your door or um, mm -hmm. getting your paperwork ready to do taxes because, you know, it's there's much resistance to that. So it's, Yes. It's so mundane for something that you know you either need to do or want to do. Um, yes. And your your point that the resistance <clears throat> is strongest were the things that you most need and want to do. Yeah. That's so well, it, important. And there's, you know, the things that just seem so insurmountable get the most resistance. And you know, that, that, that way of breaking it down, which is very mundane, you know, breaking down a task um, is helpful, but it, there's still resistance. And um, it's just, it speaks to something, you know, and. Um, yes, I, I want to thank Caitlin and her mom, Kathy. They have attended all of these sessions from Kathy's hospital room. <laughs> mom to Ty, she's just, She's just, uh, hey mom, you wanna say hi? <laughs> she's listening, she just is, she's recouping in silence at the moment. Oh, and, so. and they also have been my, my first audience for bringing these things out, out of my own heart, out into the world. So I'm very grateful. Okay, are there other folks that have come? <clears throat> Well, you know, something you said made me, you said something about um, uh, just picking up the pen and writing one sentence. <laughs> it made me think of something that I have experienced, which is, I, and I always, I talk about it as taking one, that one step beyond resistance is really awakening. Mm -hmm. But then it also brings up the question for me about, uh, when we should listen to our resistance, <laughs> mm -hmm. when we should pay attention to it and, and recognize that uh, not taking a step is taking a step, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mean like perhaps we're resistant because it's something we shouldn't move toward? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is... That reason to check with the utility company, <laughs> you know, yeah. Hi, um, my name's Laura, and I really enjoyed this. Um, 
I'm like trying to choose shoot in my life, turn the cruise ship around where I, I have now all the time, no excuses uh, to do like devotional practices and stuff. Um, but what caught my ear in your story was that when we succeed at the marriage of consciousness and desire, that reality, known reality will melt or could melt. There's a, right? So that there's, I think that might be, you know, pretty big part of the resistance. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's true. And and Parvati's willingness to slow down was undoubtedly important, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And and we can do that, you know, in part to discover is this something that's really right to move toward, but also to give ourselves time to catch up with what's changing so that it's not so frightening. Ah, ah, (laughs) really, that's a really good, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Um, I really appreciated all the, um, the metaphor and imagery you used was really helpful and um but i was you know i'm really thinking about monsters inc the movie and i'm going to share some spoilers if that's okay i know not everyone has seen it <laughs> i haven't seen it <laughs> okay no, that's <laughs> um well you know and the, the i appreciated the invitations to pause and practice and um work with the desire in real time and that energy and that consciousness um and i well one of them many came but one that came was um the desire to watch that movie again because it's so, <laughs> so joyful for me and i haven't seen it in several years and there's a second one that i haven't seen i think monster university yeah. <laughs> but you know i was thinking about in the movie, and, and yes, the monsters need to go into these children's rooms and scare them because they the the fear um, and the tears and the screams of the children fuel their whole economy and city. And then they realize, and this is a spoiler. Okay, um, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, at the end of the movie, uh, one of the monsters realizes that um, actually we don't have to scare the children to get energy. We can. Um, make them laugh and we can bring out their joy. And that is actually more energizing than the fear. Um, and so it's kind of thinking about the, yeah, I'm thinking about the, the kind of when you go really deep into it and I was working with the desire and I appreciated the reframe for me, like of the longing, uh, it can be joyful. Um, because it's that association that association is in my head of longing as sorrowful and sad Mm -hmm. Um, but sitting with that and like going underneath the turbulence and connecting to the joy um, and the love and the 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 longing for connection and how that was a completely different energy and way of relating to it and it was kind of it's a disruption of my known reality (laughs) of um in a completely new kind of fresh fresh relationship then and that is so helpful for me to hear yeah several things i want to respond to one is i'm just so glad that you that you did the spoiler because in one way that's making the whole point isn't it that we may think that we need to be frightened in order to move toward what we're trying to move toward because we that's been our experience, our whole lives, that I get frightened, that makes me study for the test, that makes me, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I do okay, so it must work. <laughs> but he discovered that laughter worked even better. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful point. And let's see, what was the other thing? Oh, well, just that you would tell me that it is a reframe for you because, you know, when when you're working on something inside yourself on your own back porch, uh, um, you wonder, okay, maybe this is not, 
maybe maybe there's nothing new here. Maybe this is what everybody already knows except me. It took me a long time to discover it, but to know, okay, all right. So it has something to offer. And so um, you have my email address. If there's anybody that has any thoughts about what the next steps for this material might be. If you know somebody <laughs> who's just looking for something like this to publish or anything like that, if you would let me know, and as well as any other reactions, because you know your responses are very helpful. All right, we have another minute before we give back the merit. I have just one thing. I, I so, so much appreciate <clears throat> the stories, because, you know, concepts are helpful, and they underlie what you said, but they're harder to hold on to. And, you know, there are so many, like, old Zen stories, the little, little nuggets that are easier for me to hold on to, and the story about Shiva and Parvati and the, and the monsters, those will stick a lot longer, I'm afraid, yeah. and, and attach me back to the basic, you know, essential ideas. But I really like your storytelling. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, I do too. In fact, you know, to, to remember the points in order to present them to you, I have to have stories because that's, that's what sticks in my mind. Otherwise, it's on the piece of paper and I just have to read them. <laughs> okay, I think we are ready to give back the merit. And, and one last time, I just thank you all for being here and giving me the chance to practice all of this because believe me, it all came up in the preparation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much susan this was this has been great i've been so looking forward to these every week and now i'm feeling like oh no next week i gotta do this <laughs> i will be here i'm looking forward to that oh i don't know what i'm gonna say because <laughs> you said everything <laughs> and may the merit of this practice may the merit of this practice benefit all beings benefit all beings and bring peace and bring peace thank you hi hi